We are on chapter 18, verse 13. And it was the next day. And Moshe, so, so we did this verse yesterday. It was the next day. We said it was the day after Yom Kippur. The day after Yom Kippur, that's what Rashi said. And, and okay, he stood over Moshe from morning until evening. And we figured out, Rashi figured out why it was the day after Yom Kippur. Now we come up to, we come up to verse 14. Vayar Hossein Moshe is Ko'asher Hu The father of Moshe saw everything that he had done to the people. And he said, Ma'adavar Azeh Asher What is this thing that you're doing to the people? Asher Atoh Selam. Ma'adavar Azeh Asher Atoh Selam. Why are you dwelling by yourself? And all the people are, are, are standing over you from the morning until the evening. So Rashi says the following. We did that Rashi yesterday. But now we're up to verse 15. So Moshe says to his father-in-law, the people are coming to me to uh, seek out judge, judge judgment. So that's what Rashi says, or to seek God, it's not clear. In the present. Meaning to say, to ask for instruction. To ask guidance from Hashem. Verse 16, verse 16. Ki elam davar bai when they have something, when they have something to judge, they come to me, vishafadati bein ishu bein reyeo, and I judge between man and, and his friend, vodati et chukai ayalokim, et chukai ayalokim ve'et Torah tab, and I make known the laws of God and his Torah. Rashi says, ki el davar, by way, when there is something, they come to me. Mishia loa davar by way, when somebody has a matter, they come to me. You as a matter comes to me. Verse 17. And the father of Moshe said back to him. So he said to him, the father of Moshe said to him, That what you're doing is not good. Can you imagine that? He said to Moshe, I don't like what you're doing. So this is the only example, I think, in the Torah of Moshe being told something and the person wasn't a sinner. Moshe being told he's doing something wrong and the person was not considered a sinner. Rashi says, This is an honorable way to redress him. He's called the father-in-law of the king. So, that what you're doing is not good. But as she explains, nothing. Then the next verse, verse 18. So the thing that you're doing, this is going to tire you out. You and all these people, you and all these people that are with you, the matter is heavier than you. You can't do it by yourself. She says, it'll tire you out. In the, like the Targum, uh, Lashon Kamisha, withering. Okay, Shukamush, Ayidei Chama, Ayidei Kerach, withers through sun and frost. Okay, Rashi, Gam Ata. Also you, also the people. Rashi says, the rabbis Aaron, the Chor, the Shivim, the Canaan. This comes to include Aaron and Chor and the 70 elders. I once heard it to Bartel Rabbi. Right? Yeah. I know it was at Lincoln Center. I don't remember. Yeah. Lincoln Square. I don't remember if it was Rabbi Berman or Rabbi Christian who said that, uh, that <coughs> his father was the original management consultant. Yes. The, this is the origin of management consultant. He said, you can't do it by yourself. He's... Basically, this is the imprint for McGinty. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. Right, right, it's true. Yeah, I'm very, Jerry. Uh, what does Rabbi Steinsaltz have to say on the Pasuk where uh, 
the father-in-law rebukes uh, Moses? Um, I don't know. What does he say? No. Rabbi Steinsaltz, in this Chumash, he, he doesn't have a comment. Oh. Gamata, so sorry. He says it's too much for you. So, so the 17 seems like a rebuke, but if you look at the full context, it's not a rebuke. It's, yeah. it's advice. Well, he's giving it, yeah, for sure. But that's the whole question. When does rebuke become advice? And when is it advice? And when is it rebuke? That's the whole question. That's the whole drasha. What's the difference between the wise son and the wicked son at the Seder? They're both saying the exact same thing. I mean, is it an extension of Kibbut Abba Aim that he has to listen to his father-in-law to some extent? And, you know, it's the right of every in-law to sort of you know, counsel their son in the way that they would think, why does it necessarily have to be a rebuke? How can we can't be looked at in, in more paternal instinct? Yeah, no, I'm saying, but you're not, uh, by the way, just so you know, you're not obligated to listen to your father or father-in-law about, about everything. Not to you, but certainly in general ethics, you would want to respect, you give couple to your father-in-law, wouldn't you? Yeah, I certainly take it, what he says seriously. They say, oh yeah, hold on, let me just make uh, Rabbi Yosef the co-host. Um, you certainly want, um, there's a story that's told that I think it was told about Rabbi Soloveitchik that he was, uh, his father, Rabbi Moshe Soloveitchik was the Rosh Yeshiva, Yeshiva University, and they didn't approve of uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik's choice of a wife. It was a very uh, strong woman, Tanya Soloveitchik. And at the, well, I don't know what she was originally, but, uh, but then, Rabbi Salvechik wrote him a letter. I don't know where he was in Europe. And he and he got the letter in front of uh, Rabbi Moshe Salvechik got the letter while I was teaching the Gemara here. They said, here's a letter from your son. So he opened it up and he said, I understand you don't want me to marry her, but, uh, but according to the Shulchan Aruch, I'm not required to listen to you when it comes to my wife. For sure. So, so he said, my son has defeated me. My son has defeated me. <laughs> yeah, and then he said, for sure, no. It's his own, no, it is what the, the, the wife is his own choice because you can't, you can, you can't point the direction when it comes to the wife. It's his choice. Yeah, it's his choice. And a lot of, a lot, but you say for sure, but a lot of parents don't necessarily agree with that. Let's just say like that. Let's just say like that, unfortunately. I mean, they're trying to do what's best, but at the end of the day, you're not required to listen to your parent if your parent does not approve of your spouse. And that's kind of like what that, the most important course, decision you're going to make in what's, life. What's the source for that? What's the source for that? There's, um, go ahead. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but uh, what were you going to say, Sessa? There's, there's, a, there's a bunch of uh, metric, uh, metric that it, that these things are all sort of gathered from there, but in like, uh, acceptable version of what's hit people down the aim. Well, I know you study. No, no, but I'm saying is. But I'm saying the sources you're asking, yeah. I think, are not like from, it's cobbled together from different, you know, from RI and metrics and different things. Like no, that. yeah, so that's what he, so we're trying to, I'm trying to remember what's the source for the Shulchan Aruch. I think it was the Ramah, first of all, and where, where it's based upon which, whether it's a Gemara or not. And I, you know, well, there is a famous Gemara a very, very well-known Gemara where a, a, a woman does not listen to her father. That's Rabbi Akiva's wife. She didn't want, she didn't want to marry, um, she didn't want to marry, um, she wanted to marry Rabbi Akiva and, and he and her father, Kalba Savua, took a vow that she couldn't get any money if he didn't marry. In the end, she didn't listen to her father. So that, I don't know if that's the source I put back at the Ramah, but that could be a source in the Gemara. That could be a source, but I'm trying to remember in the Torah, in the Torah, if there was any, oh, well, in the Torah, we see that the girl was asked before she married, they, they, they couldn't force her. That was the case of Rivka, that they asked her if she would agree to get married. Yeah, but that's, that's totally Yeah, it's totally not the same. Also, a father is able to marry off his daughter against her will. Yeah. Okay, so, but that's only when she's under the age of 12. When she turns 12, he can't do it. What's the source for that? That's the Torah. The Torah, the Torah it says, it's in the beginning of Parashas Mishpatim, that you can marry, a father can marry off his minor daughter. I have the source for what he's asking for. I'll bring it tomorrow. Ah, oh, beautiful. The Bli Nader. Bli Nader. Shem gives us the strength. So, okay, then it states, Gamata. So, 
It's too much. Verse 19. Listen to my voice. I'll give you advice and let God be with you. May God be, I shall advise you, may God be with you. For the people opposite God, and you shall bring these matters to God. Verse 19, Rashi says, I'm going to advise you with advice. He says, Yisra said to Moshe, go out and consult Hashem. You should be for the people opposite Hashem. Be uh, intermediary between them and God. And you shall ask for judgments from him. Okay. Okay, so he's basically saying, you should be the intermediary between the people and God. You shall caution them. You shall caution the people. You shall teach them the laws and the Torah, and you shall make known to them the path that they should go on and the actions that they should do. Uh, she says, on that, nothing. Now you should look for the people. Okay, this is it. Bring this to the Senate Judiciary Committee. I'm sure that they know this law, though. You shall now look for all the people on Shekhael. This is how you look for judges. On Shekhael, people of um, means, Yireo Kim, God fearing. On Shemes, people of truth, Sone Vatsa, people who ate bribes. Visamta Oem Sarel, Afim Sare Meot, Sare Chamishim, Misare Asarot. And ye shall have officers over thousands, over hundreds, over fifty, and over ten. So this is a judicial system, or is this a political system? Is this a system of governance, or is this a system of judges? It's unclear. It's a high, it is hierarchy. It is establishing an organization and hierarchy. Hierarchy, but it, it, you don't really need a judge for 10 people. Like, well, how many people? I mean, I've had a lot of litigation, but most people <laughs> don't. Most people probably go through their whole life without a litigation. So you don't need a judge for 10 people. Interestingly, the, the sort of social science tells us that the ideal number of direct reports that someone should have is not. And this is what do you mean direct that. reports? So if you're a oh. manager, oh, okay. right? It, depending on what job you have, but more than nine direct reports, more than nine people who you're managing is, is too many. And so the Torah says 10. It's pretty close to what the social science says. So that's, yeah. I can't imagine having to, I guess nine is not so bad. Depends what you mean by reporting, but that's another conversation. I mean, when, I, when I was general counsel, I had 16 direct reports and it was way too much. You mean you had to report to 16 people? No, I had 16 people, he, managers who direct, directly reported, uh, to, reported, you. reported to me. It's way too many. You had to, you had to manage 16 different people. Directly. You know, I had 600 plus people. So the question comes agree. up here. Yeah. Here's the question. Very, very good question. So how is it that Yisro yeah. had to suggest such an obvious solution? How come Moshe couldn't think of it on his own? Moses, the master of all prophets, the wisest of all sages. Yeah. And his comes in and says, the judge. Yeah. He couldn't, he couldn't think of it by himself. So what do they answer? They don't. Who asked that question? About him. Barbara now. Okay. Well, uh, the question is, is that the way the way uh, Rashbam says it is, is that, that, that here you are, I mean, let's just imagine how this is taking place. Here's Moshe. This is all brand new what's happening. This has never happened to them before. Yeah. Up to now, they live in a much different system. So Moshe is standing, I mean, sitting, and the people that... It, the way Rajvam described it, everybody's screaming at once because everybody wants to get their case in. I mean, they've been holding it on for 210 years, you know, these questions. Everybody's screaming. And uh, Yisro says, how can you possibly handle all of this? You need some kind of a, of a way to, 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 to uh, hire our guys, but, but with an organized way so people feel that there's a connection between them and the law, it's probably. 
So, so they want just to give people the connection, not just to, it's not so that's the answer. I was saying it's not just about a system of judging people. It's about giving people a feeling of being connected. You know that they that they need this connection. That it's not it's not it can't just have it. Moshe Rabbeinu is by himself. It's not enough. As they say, that's no way to run a meeting. And that's what screaming at once. And that's what the Rebbe did. That's what the Rebbe's genius was. And all the Hasidic Rebbe's, all the other Hasidic Rebbe's. There's one Rebbe, but the Ubavitch Rebbe has all these shluchim. So they are connected without ever having met the Rebbe or spoken to the Rebbe. They're all connected to the Rebbe through their own personal shliach. Who may be a shliach for 10, a shliach for 50, a shliach for 100. So it's the same idea. So Yisro seems to understand what's going on here, the dynamics. And he realizes Moshe does, is reluctant to let go because he's worried. I mean, I'm delegating to this guy. He's a very nice guy. He's rich and famous. But, but how do I know he, he, he's, a, he's never had this system before of people are just delegating. So Yisro realizes that, that this, this idea of, of holding on is very dangerous. So he's saying to Moshe, you know, you're going to wear yourself thin and you're going to, as they say, people, people get, get very uh, sick from exhaustion. Exactly right. Exactly right. Very, very good trying point. To protect them. So let's see what Raj says. An Shechaya, what does that mean? It means Ashirim. You have to appoint judges who are wealthy. Why wealthy? So basically, when you think about it, it wasn't a paid job. Who could do this job? Only somebody who could afford it, right? You weren't wealthy. Well, Raj gives a different explanation. They have no need to flatter or to show favorites. They also have to have discretionary time. By the way, I can't imagine that that's actually true. Rich people flatter plenty. They're, all day long, they're kissing up to people. No, seriously, just because you're wealthy doesn't mean you don't have to flatter. And I mean, yeah, you get to make jokes that everybody has to laugh at, I get that. But still, they, they're not really immune from flattery. There's nobody who's immune from having to flatter. What are men of truth? These are men who inspire confidence. You can rely upon them. Because as a result of this, their words will be heeded. Okay. So, so, so what does it mean? Sone Vetsa? Shasonin Esmamonim Badin. That they, that they hate their money that's in litigation. Meaning to say, they'll, they'll settle a case, they'll lose the case rather than, rather than um, go to litigation. A judge whose money is taken away through litigation is not a judge. Plaintiff's lawyers should not be judges. Plaintiff lawyers should not be judges, but there's also a source for the idea that a prosecutor should not be a judge. In Kategor, Nasa, Senegar, don't make the prosecutor into the defense attorney, basically. So nobody, no, but that's exactly the opposite of what happened because you, who becomes a judge, either the prosecutor or the defense attorney? You know, who else is there? There's, I guess, government employees or professors. Well, no, but, but what I'm saying is plaintiff's lawyers who've made their money by litigation, this is essentially about to say they shouldn't be judges. Well, no, it's not the plaintiff lawyer. It's the it's the person who himself made money by suing somebody else, not the lawyer suing. But it's the same idea. Or you could say anybody who made a lot of money as a lawyer shouldn't be a judge. But usually it's the exact opposite way in which you become a judge. You become a judge because you donated. It's money that was taken away from a person. Right, so lawyers... Who lost. Right. Yeah, so that's why I said it's the actual litigant, not the lawyer. But the idea is they despise money. You only put somebody as a judge who's someone who despises money. Okay, good luck. Especially if he's a rich person. Good luck. Yeah, Mordechai. Um, the... How are you going to find thousands of people like that? You can find one. Yeah, Mordechai. The, uh, the description of the IRS hierarchy of the Jewish state does it explain how cases are passed from one level of judge to the next 
That's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't explain it here. And the, the Torah does speak elsewhere of a Supreme Court, but it doesn't discuss the levels getting up to it. So the commentaries understand that each tribe had their own judicial system, kind of like each state today has their own courts. But it's a... Uh, is, isn't there a description of like the court system of which levels in, in the Mishnah? In the Mishnah, in, San, in Sanhedrin, it talks about different cases. And then it also talks about if you, if you have a matter that's too hard for your local town, you go to the larger town. But it's not, it's not in the Torah, except the Torah says that if you have a question which is too difficult, you go to the judge in those days. So the, the, Talmud, the Torah does discuss it, but it doesn't go into the nitty gritty of the judicial system. But the Mishnah does. The Mish it's not a uh, the Mishnah talks about it in more detail, but doesn't go. It also leaves a lot on on um, doesn't describe everything. Yeah, Rabbi Yosef. Back to what you said about Sanai Beta in the Varim, what Rashi comments that Moshe couldn't find any. That's so why it's not, that's what he says. Yeah, Beautiful. not here, but I thought there was here in verse twenty six. He couldn't find not. anybody who, who hates money. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, when you think about it, how are you going to find such a person? That's why it's usually it's usually understood to mean betza is usually a bribe. Ma betza, what do we gain? But not just money. The Rashi says shesonim as mamon What about the nazir? Do they take money or not? Not. A nazir could take money. Why can't he? He's an extremist, but. He's just, technically speaking, a nazir is just somebody who doesn't drink wine, cut in contact with the dead, or cut his hair. Seems to be just isolated, but maybe, yeah. Yeah, but it's really more, it speaks to a personality type. Okay. Sarai Alafim, Hemayu Sheishmeot Sarim, Sheishmeot Alafim. There were 600 of these leaders for 600,000 adult male Israelites, which is, by the way, which is, which is a lot. A lot, but when you think about it, there are 700,000 people in uh, D.C. and there are 13 council members. And that's the highest form of representation in D.C. And then, you know, like, so 600 for 600,000 is a lot of people. You're having a lot of representation there. Wait, it's better. What? It's better. Then there were 6,000. And there were 12,000. There were 12,000. And there were 12,000. And there were 12,000. And there were 12,000. And then there were sorry, I wrote Shishimov, 60,000. When you think about it, so how many people of these 600,000 were actually serving in this uh, capacity? It would be 78,600. Uh, so one out of six people basically was a, uh, was a judge. Well, or that, that's why this argues for it being more of a management system. Right? Yeah. Mean, that looks much more like a modern corporation yeah. than like a judicial system. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but then it says, Vishaftu as a arm. The whole ace, by Yako, the Vargado, you have you a lacha called the Varkata Nish between, the Kelme Lacha and a sweet talk. So they said, you're right. Now the word shoftim here they translate it as judge, but the word shoftim in the uh, Bible is lead, is the lead you. So the the shoftu, you know, like book of shoftim is a is a book of leaders. So it doesn't necessarily mean judges. So they'll, they'll we could translate it as they'll lead the people at all times. And the thing that is great they'll bring to you. The thing that is small they'll they'll figure out on their own. And they'll be too, and they'll make it easier for you, and they shall bear the, the problem with you. But the thing is, most it's not Moshe Rabbeinu, he gets his authority when the person asks Moshe a question, he gets his authority directly from God. When these people are asked a the question, they could be making it up, they don't have the same level of authority. So I just think that this can make Moshe's job a lot harder. Everybody's already asking all these questions. 
And by the way, I mean, he had a lot of rebellions. I don't know. They shall judge. Rashi says, It's imperative. This matter will make your job easier. Okay. Okay. Verse 23. If you do this matter, and God will command you. And if you do this matter, and God will command you, and you'll be able to endure it, and all these people will come in peace. I mean, to say this is a perfect idea. Ask God. If God wants you to do this, then you could stand. And if he stops you, you won't be able to do it. And all these people, and Aaron and another one of you, and the 70 elders are becoming worn out with you, they'll also follow you. I mean, it's very, very, uh, very, very confusing, actually, because there's no Who's appointing all these people? Moshe. Moshe. Moshe's appointing all 78,000? I mean, this is why it's about delegation. Moshe is going to specifically appoint all 78,000. What says verse 25? By Yitzchak Moshe. Yeah, it says Moshe appoints them. But how is it even possible? Can you imagine having to choose 78,000 people for a job? One person? Appointing 78,000, like maybe there was a vetting system and he just gave the final approval after the tribe said, This is who's going to be. This that's much more be. logical to assume. Than also, it's a payless, payless, and thankless job. I mean, 78,000 people is just not even possible. Like, what, what, what's it's the big like formal thing when a president just right. comes and signs okay. after Seth the Seth is right, yeah, Seth <laughs> is obviously that has to be correct, but that he was he had the final say. You could probably maybe look into the heart of each person they walked in front of, but even just to, to physically sign checks 78,000 times is an enormous amount. All right, we'll stop here. We have to have a mincha. Praise everybody for a beautiful.